Welcome to Dropout 22, a GD media production. Two Welshmen, an Aussie and an Englishman walk into a radio show. What do you get? A massive preview of the biggest game in the Northern Hemisphere. England against Wales this weekend has there ever been a bigger game in the Six Nations it's going to be absolutely massive and just dissect it all we've got Patrick Andrews Guy Griffiths and Luke Milton as well as that we've got turnover ball we've got Pat Stats and we've got a brand new feature for you this week called Extra Time it's going to be a belter of a show welcome aboard Gentlemen, welcome to Dropout 22, a very special Dropout 22, a Wales versus England, or England versus Wales, I should say, special. Um, we're going to start off with Corsi's quiz this week, boys, um, because it's a bit of a special one. So we'll get out the way early, and there's a reason for that, is because I don't think you're going to be able to answer it uh, all now. Guy, Milt, welcome to the show, by the way. I've, uh, very rude, I didn't introduce you. Yeah, good, good evening all, good evening. Exciting. It's an exciting week. It certainly is. Patty, in the studio with me. Hello, mate. Good to be back. Feeling the nerves? Yeah, very nervous. Good, good. Right, Corsi's quiz this week. There are nine teams playing in the top leagues over the ponds. That's in the NHL, the NBA, the MLB, and the other one? NFL. NBA, NFL. NFL, even. Um whose nicknames do not end with an S. So, for example, you couldn't have the LA Lakers, you could not have the Boston Bruins. So there are nine teams whose nicknames do not end with S. Who are they? Uh, the old American sport. Let, let, let's do this together. Um, <laughs> right, I can't think of any at all. Uh, everything ends in an S. Right, what we'll do is... I, I, I don't think I can think of nine teams full stop. But, yeah. <laughs> Guys, didn't we do this last week? Um, uh... Yeah, I said it's, that. It's like, it's like Miami Heat. We did what, this last what's, week. What's New Jersey I know we said, I know we did it last week, and I told you off air that we had problems with it last week, and it hasn't been published. So we're doing it again this week. So <laughs> 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 Miami Heat. Miami Heat. We got one. <laughs> Miami, Miami Heat. Red Sox. Red Sox. <laughs> Red Sox. White Sox. Utah Jazz. I remember them all from last week. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a villain. Red Sox, White Sox, Utah Jazz, Orlando Magic. Orlando Magic for Patty. Right, we'll leave it there. If you think of any others that come into your head, you wait until I am talking. Do not do not interrupt each other. Wait till I'm talking. Buzz in. Milts, let's hear your buzzer. Beep. Guy, let's hear your buzzer. Pat, let's hear your buzzer. Boo! Nice. There's your buzzers for this week. Buzz in when I'm talking and you can add one to the mix. Boys, let's get right stuck into it. England against Wales this week. Oh my God, it's always huge, but it's just even bigger this year. It's carries so much to do with the, with, with the tournament. The winner of this probably goes on to win the whole thing. England are still chasing a Grand Slam after a disastrous World Cup. So what we've done, we have asked our panellists, to rate each player. We have got two Englishmen, two Welshmen and a Scotsman who have rated. So it can't be fairer, boys. And we will go through each of them and see who, according to the stats, come out on top. So we'll start with the forwards. Um, and it's the starting 15 from the last out in so um, it was the Wales team against France and the England team against Ireland. Um, Wales have named an unchanged team. England yet to name their starting squad. So we will start at loose head. We have got Joe Marler up against Rob Evans, and the stats are as follows: Joe Marler has got an average rating from the five of us of five point eight, and Rob oh, Evans no. with six point eight. <laughs> Who is Rob Evans? How many caps he got? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how many caps he's got. He, str- he scrummages straight, unlike Mr. Marley. <laughs> well, he, he 
got a reserve judgment on him, surely. He's only played about two games, I mean, You can only judge him on the games that he's played, and, he, and he's played very well, so... I haven't seen enough of him. I don't watch the Robocop League, so I haven't seen him play. Oh, well, why did you give him 7 out of 10, then? <laughs> <laughs> did I? Oh, no, yeah, on his, yeah, currently player, yeah. You can't, the front row's gone well, so you got we got to give him that, haven't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Brilliant. We've got the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lukey Milton giving him exactly the same rating as Joe Marler and then absolutely <laughs> slicing it. <laughs> uh, that was rushed. That was rushed. We'll move along to Hooker. Dylan Hartley against Scott Baldwin. Um, Scott Baldwin not had the best Six Nations so far. He's at 6.0. Dylan Hartley hasn't fired either, but he's at 6.2. So, Milt's a little edge for you there. Patty, what do you make of the two hookers so far? Yeah, from what I've seen, um, I, to, be, to be fair, I'm usually pissed when the games are on, so my my uh, <laughs> my, my observing skills aren't, as, aren't the best. But I, I think I've been pretty happy with the way Dylan Hartley's been playing from an England perspective. Um, certainly doing everything he needs to be doing. And over to the tight end, we have got Dan Cole against Samson Lee. Dan Cole comes out with the same score as Dylan Hartley at 6.2. Samson Lee... At 6.6, so another little win for Wales there, Guy. Yeah, I think that's a fair result, to be honest. Dan Cole deserves a, uh, a defeat, up there considered, a bit higher um, than uh, Marla. Definitely, I think that's the strongest side of England scrum. But uh, I think Samson, he, he's basically one of the first names on the team sheet. He's the cornerstone of our pack now, and I think he's well established. So definitely, definitely worthy of a... Uh, of beating uh, Dan Cole at the moment, I think he's one of the form. Uh, along with that WP now, I think he's one of the form tight ends in uh, in Britain. And Mills Dan Cole's just giving a lot of penalties away at the moment, isn't he? He does. He, he, like, he got into a really good habit of turning ball over a couple of years ago, but that seems to have been tinged with, uh, like you say, giving away a lot of penalties. But you do take his scrummaging for granted. It's very rare with an England scrum that with Dan Cole in it that we struggle. Um, he's a very big man. He's very. He's quite younger than you think as well. I think he's only about 28, 29. He looks about 40. <laughs> he's, got fair, he's got a fair bit of experience behind him. And I think he's pretty important. I think Jones will build, build the pack around him. I can't see... I mean, Brooks has come in. and I've, I've read a lot of articles that he's highly rated. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes down the line. But you know, Cole's a pretty... Like, a bit like Samson Lee turned into a bit of a cornerstone of the English pack. So, Wales just getting the nudge on England in the front row, according to our ratings. We'll move into the second row. George Cruz against head-to-head against Bradley Davis. George Cruz comes out way on top. 7.2 for him. Bradley Davis down at 5.8. And then Maro Itoji. He's at 6.6, but he's eclipsed by Alan Wynne-Jones with an 8.0. What do you reckon of the Battle of the Boiler Room then, Patty? Yeah, look, it's probably fair enough. Um, just following on from the front row scores as well, I think the Welsh scrums probably been more dominant so far throughout the tournament as opposed to the English scrum. So fair, uh, fair shout there. And their set piece lineouts haven't been haven't been the best for for England, and they've certainly been quite strong for uh, for the Welsh. So fair, fair news there. An area that we can target, guy. Uh, yeah, using Milford's argument. Uh, about Rob Evans, Mario told you he's brand new as well, but we've uh, seemed to have scored him quite highly. He's just he gets around a bit, doesn't he? Puts him makes himself prominent. I think we've definitely got the edge in the um, in the second rows. The English second rows are really busy, but I think Alice has got a bit more class at the end of the day. And Mills, what what do you make of George Cruz the way he's come on, and who do you want to see partner him in the role? Did it told you do enough for you last week? I think he did, yeah. I thought he played really, really well. Um, I, I, I like I like Launchbury, so... And Laws, you know, this time last year, everyone was raving about Laws. So I think you got... England seem, always seem to have a good base of second rows. We're never short of second rows. I think Alan Wynne-Jones, though, would arguably get into a lot of people's world 15s at the moment. I think he's he's definitely... He's a potential Lions captain. Um, but, yeah, Brad Davis is just a big lump, isn't he? You know what you're going to get with him. Um, him and Charles are very different, but uh, yeah, you know, strong second rows for both teams. I think definitely. Uh, I think they'll uh, they'll probably cancel each other out there, and then it paves the way for a fascinating battle in the back row. Wales have gone and changed 
Um, seems very, very likely that England will do the same. So at six, you've got a battle between Dan Lydiot and Chris Robshaw. And would you believe it, both have come back with scores of 6.6. So I would believe that. Would you? Yeah. It's written down there. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah. yeah, nice. Um, I mean, th- th- again, very different players, but we, sh- we saw something different from Robshaw last, last, last time out with a huge looping pass over the top to put Watson into the corner. He just seems to be settling in nicely at six. I think it was Robin Ward who said when we were doing our dropout 22 awards that he'll settle in at six and everyone will forget about him because he's just he's the dog and he, he'll just get the job done. Are you happy to see him back at six, Mel? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I am. He's, I, I've watched the game in like different places, like a rugby club, um, with work friends there's a lot of negative feeling towards him but I don't know many people that are Rob Shaw fans out there but you know, I, quite, I quite like him like you say he does get he does get the job done he's, when he's when he was playing well he like, would often stand at first receiver and distribute um, he'd carry in difficult situations that's when Rob Shaw was really playing well he just seems to have gone away from that he's got a good set of hands and then I think that's what he needs to bring to his game even more Your, his work rate's phenomenal then absolutely phenomenal he, He's very rarely more than ten meters from the ball, which is uh, which is a good sign. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy for him. I think he was set up to fail with uh, with being. Uh, I don't think he was the right person to be captain. I don't, certainly don't think he was playing in the right position. And, and plus, all that pressure of a home world cup. Uh, and I think uh, I'm glad to see him uh, doing well at six. And I think he's doing really well at six. He's certainly freed him up to to play uh, a bit more adventurous uh, rugby for him as well. No, definitely. Yep. And well, the battle is going to be. Maybe one and lost at number seven, where James Haskell comes in at six point two, and Sam Warburton a whole grade ahead of him at seven point two. Guy, is there that much of a gulf between the two of them? I think that's really mean on uh, Sam Warburton, to be honest. Yeah, score agree. that low. Yeah, he's a uh, his head and shoulders better than Haskell. Haskell goes in, does a job. He, I say to Haskell, he's been playing quite well. He's very underrated for what he does. He basically goes in and refs the other team up, but he's not a seven at the end of the day. First and foremost, he's got um, he's been played out of position, same as Robshaw was. And if you watch what Warburton does for that Welsh team, yes, it's not pretty, um, but it is just it's just pure. It's just he just wrecks teams. They run they run straight down the guts, and Warburton's there, always there. It's the same as what Pocock does. It's not, never pretty. It's just always there, always been a nuisance. And I think he's just. Um, He's become invaluable to Wales the way they play. Like we always talk about putting um, to Birkin, but unless we're going to change the way we play, we cannot drop Warburton because he's just he goes in and just knits the entire back row together. Because we know how hard Faletau works for a team, but without Warburton, Faletau would have to do that twice the work. So I think it's a bit mean that uh, they scored so close together. And um, Faletau can't possibly work twice as hard because then it'd mean him making forty-five tackles and forty-five carries every game. <laughs> But we come on to the number eight, and it is another deadlock. Billy Vanapola and Taolupe Falatau both scoring 8.6. And by the way, they are the highest scoring uh, players in both teams. I mean, th- they are just that good, aren't they, Mills? They, they've got to be 1-2 one, two, one, two in the world, maybe 1-2-3 in the world. They're on the podium, certainly. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, Paris and maybe and Kieran Reid will probably argue, but yeah, they're, they're very influential for both. I think Faletau, I think it's only this Six Nations really he's getting the plaudits. I mean, he's, he's been he's consi- he never misses a game. I can't remember the Wales playing anyone else at eight for the last five years, and he's just like his work rate's good. There's no weakness there. There is no weakness. With the you know, I don't know whether it was giving the vice captaincy or losing some weight, but. You can't really picture an England team without him in it now. He's becoming really important ball carrier. Um, I think what Rob Shaw, by picking Rob Shaw and uh, Haskell, it does free him up a lot. It enables him to carry a lot, which is obviously what he's really good at. And if those two can come together with a run up, it could be interesting on Saturday. Patty, you're shaking your head vociferously next to me. What, what do you disagree with there? Spell vociferously. Uh, v. <laughs> <laughs> Um, why did two in the world? He's up. Pocock's a better eight, and he's a seven. Um, certainly, <laughs> certainly good players, though, and, and deservedly the, the top two, I think, um, for each team. But I don't think uh, 
Well, Vuli v- v- Pola, he had a good game last week, uh, but a- has he been uh, enough to warrant an 8.6 across across the tournament so far? For me, probably not. Um, yeah, so so interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting as well, because it's, it's not long ago that you said live on Dropout 22 that David Pogak was just a poor man, Sam Warburton. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we will... Uh, we will come back to do the backs in a sec, boys, but just assessing the forwards on our ratings, that gives the Wales pack a total of 55.6 and the England pack a total of 53.4. Head-to-head, Wales are in front in four of those head-to-heads with Rob Evans, Samson Lee, Alimin Jones and Sam Warburton getting the better of Joe Mahler, Dan Cole, Maru Itoji and James Haskell. You've got... One, uh, two deadlock, sorry, with Chris Robshaw, Dan Lydiot, level, and Billy Vonapola, and Talupe Falatau, level. And then England are in front with two positions with Dylan Hartley and George Cruz. Now, we are going to cruise over to Pat Stutt. Ho-ho, ho Okay, gentlemen, I only have two for you today. So, um, uh, Milt, you picked it last week. Guy, it's your turn. Uh, number 141 or number 79? Uh, 79, please, Paddy. Uh, very fitting that you chose number 79 because this stat is the only Welsh Rugby Union international killed by a poison arrow. <laughs> that would be uh, Mr. Norman Biggs at Sakaba, Sakaba Kebi, mind you, Nigeria, on Thursday, the 27th of February, 1908. Um, there is a big write up here about Mr. Biggs, however. Just to sum it up for you guys, um, he, he was uh, educated at, at Cambridge, uh, played rugby for Cardiff, and uh, became the youngest player to represent Wales. And that was against New Zealand natives on the 22nd of December, 1888, when he was 18 years old and 49 days. It was a record that stood for more than a century before being broken by Tom Purdy in 2010. So that's fascinating enough in itself, I think. Um, after outbreak of the Boer War, Biggs volunteered for services and was posted to the Glamorgan Yeomanry and was wounded when he was shot through the thigh near Verdi on the 11th of October 1900. Uh, he was later promoted to second lieutenant and then full lieutenant and he was appointed uh, an instructor of musketry. Uh, that's, a, that's a job title, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> just, just quietly. I, I have a... a, a a business card that says P- Patrick Andrews, instructor of musketry. Jobs for the boys. On, uh, on the 10th of May 1905, he was uh, sent to northern Nigeria as a superintendent of police. On patrol, two years later, he was killed when a poison arrow struck him. So there you go, the storied life and times of Norman Biggs. Nice one, Biggsy boy. Thank you, Patty. More of that next week. Um, before we go to turn of a ball, any movement on... The nine teams, boys. We... Oh, I was thinking the whole time. I, I, I'm really struggling. Just to, to recap, we've got the Miami Mi- Heat, Miami Heat, Utah Jazz, Sox, Red Sox, White Sox, Orlando Magic. Four to go. There's, surely there's another Sox. Is there a Blue Sox? No. Talking to my team over here. All right, sorry. Um, four to go. I, I, I've been going through the NFL teams in my head. I can't think of an NFL team, but there must be one. Is there one? There is not an NFL team. Didn't think so. Despite the fact that you said three seconds ago that there must be one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. despite it. <laughs> well, well uh, it was quite a vociferous comment, really. It was very vociferous. Right, over to you then. Take it away, turnover ball. Uh, turnover ball, a la David Pocock, I'm over it. No, <laughs> um, today, well, there's a few things we could talk about, really, but uh, I think in light of recent events, it has to be... Uh, Maria Sharapova and the the controversy that's surrounding her, her positive drugs test at the Australian Open. Um, I'm going to open this up. I, I was feeling two different ways about it. Uh, initially, I thought uh, I heard the story that it, look, it was some heart medication uh, to uh, as a preventative against some family history of diabetes and, and and heart disease. So I thought, look, that's pretty standard, easy mistake to make, but. Um, as it, uh, some more information has come to light, and I've delved a little deeper, it certainly seems that it, this isn't a case of, uh, of, of an accident, and that this was quite deliberate, and um, they knew what they were doing was, was potentially risky. Uh, Milts, what do you reckon? Where, where, where do you stand on it all? 
I'm pretty pretty firm on if these guys are getting paid extortion amounts of money to watch what you eat and drink, I don't think it's too big at us. So any kind of uh, complaint about it was medication, that you know, their, their bodies are their job. They should take more, and I think they should be firm. And I, I think if she was a, a Russian male sprinter, I think you would be thinking instant big bat. Because she's a pretty female tennis player, you can't imagine cheating. I think for some reason she's getting a little bit of sympathy. I think the ban has to be big. I think athletics is almost having to reinvent reinvent itself through drug cheats, and we don't want that in sport. So I'd hit her with a big ban. I just I'd think there has to be a stance taken on it. You know, these guys, these guys and girls have to take their bodies seriously and what they're putting into it. Certainly, certainly. Guy, what do you reckon? I'm not sure that um, she is being let off in the media. She's being pretty. Um pretty uh, uh, taken down as far as I'm concerned. She, she is, firstly, uh, the, the highest earning female athlete uh, ever. She had the biggest endorsement deals uh, and certainly um, you know, a, a, a global name in that respect. How do you think the media is taking it so far? What's your interpretation, Guy? Has she been uh, dealt with rather softly or, or is it uh, appropriate? What do you reckon? It, it doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's, it's spot on what Milk said, to be honest. It doesn't seem like it's... Um as gunning for her as it would be if it was some sort of male athlete who wasn't followed by so many of these big companies, to be honest. It's, um, I can't see the logic in banning somebody who has clearly cheated for 10 years in the career, because that's, that's how long she's been taking this for, um, banning her for a short period to let her just come back again. I think the entire banning system is, is part of the problem, the fact that you can... Well, Justin Yatlin is the perfect example. He's cheated yeah. twice, and now he's back in the Olympics with a very, very good chance of turning Usain Bolt over for the gold medal. And the entire country will get behind him. He's got massive sponsorship deals behind him. He hasn't lost out at all by cheating. Um, it has to be a, a it, it has to be re looked at. Look, hit the nail on the head about athletics. He's had to reinvent itself. I don't think it's too much to ask for these. Um, athletes and these, all these um, sportsmen and women to look at what they put into their body to the extent where if you cheat and if you get caught cheating, that's you done. You're gone for, gone for good from that sport. It's, uh, I think it's time for a bit of a change in, uh, in attitudes because even today, Novak Djokovic, the best player in the world in the, in, the, in the same sport, has just said that he feels sorry for her. I hope she comes back. Yeah, and well, that well, cannot be it. Yeah. Hold on there, hold on there. This, this wasn't something that was... Um previously has been banned for the 10 years she's been using it. This this is something that has recently uh, been added to the ban list. So it's not like... Yeah, uh, I, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't a Lance Armstrong yeah. si- situation where it's a systematic and, and knowing uh, um, abuse of, of, of the law and, and, and bypassing the, the rules there. Uh, that, certainly the way it's been portrayed, this is this is, could almost be considered a, 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 a you know... A, a, Quite an innocent mistake. Gee, what do you reckon? Oh, well, I, is, is it uh, is it on par with with Lance Armstrong, or is it this is this more of a uh, a mistake? What do you think? It's not on par with it, but it's not a mistake at the same time. Look, you don't take something for ten years. You don't take medication for ten years for for a disease you don't have. That's not she available never, she never in your own country, it. and you, she was warned about it five times. That's that's not come out, and it. For, I, I, it really angers me that she's been able to control this whole thing through the press. Why aren't? Why didn't Wada take the initiative and come out and say she'd been found guilty, she'd been banned? Why does she get given the opportunity to face up to the media, to put a nice pretty dress on and put a nice pretty face out there and make it seem like it's, it's someone else's fault? It's entirely her fault. Completely echo what Milt said earlier. These guys are paid a load of money and their job are their, is their body. And they have to know exactly what's going in and out of it. And she's got no one else to blame but herself. And I'm not buying any of this innocence. She was taking it to uh, perf- enhance her performance. And th- the thing is with this, with the drug situation as well, is that the, the people supplying the drugs are so far ahead of the people trying to monitor the drugs and the people trying to ban the drugs that athletes are already one step ahead they're going to take something and then and then it gets put on the banned list and then maybe they'll consider whether they stop taking it or not she should have stopped taking it she didn't she gets banned should be for life 
Fair enough. Uh, certainly playing a bit of devil's advocate on my, my side of things. Definitely tend to agree with you, lads. Um, as I said, yep. uh, when I first saw it playing out, it looked like it was an honest mistake. But as you said, uh, uh, a, a drug for, for a disease she doesn't have that's not even prescribed in her own country that she had to go to Lithuania, I think it was, in order to obtain. So certainly murky there. And, and I'm not sure if I agree with you if, if it wasn't a, a, a pretty girl, if it was a, a Russian bloke, would it be different? Um, I certainly know that if uh, if she was a Russian bloke, I'd have some very confusing feelings uh, from from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely stuff. Thank you, Patty, and we'll be back with Turn of a Ball next week. Boys, let's jump straight back into England, Wales, and we have got the backs to discuss. We'll start off at fullback, Milts' position. Mike Brown, six point six. Liam Williams, six point six. Mm, they're both good players, but they both haven't really sparked yet, have they? Milt, what do you reckon? Yeah, I would say this is the first time since Brown's become a regular he hasn't sparked. So I'd, I'd have him. I would definitely have him above Liam Williams. As if your life was on the line, I think you'd only pick Brown. Even surely the Welsh would, would agree with that. But I haven't seen enough of Williams play. You boys talk him up, and he looks like he's got a bit about him. He's, he's very skinny. But he's very, uh, he seems quite elusive. Browns, oh, Browns for England has been Mr. Reliable. He never has a bad game. He's probably one of the few positives of the World Cup. Um, he's ultra aggressive. He seems to always break the first tackle. Always makes that last pitch tackle as well. Safe under the high ball. All the characteristics of your traditional fullback, really. He doesn't pass the ball much. I'm, I know it's Brian O'Driscoll kind of dig at him on uh, BT Sport about not passing the ball. And ever since then, I seem to notice that he actually never does pass the ball, yeah. um, which is the complete opposite of Alex Goode. Uh, but you know, I fully expect him. England Wales, he's the type of guy you're going to want in the tunnel. I think he, you know he's going to, he's pretty much going to have a, a minimum six out of ten, and hopefully he can spark back into a bit of form. And the one thing that uh, that could happen is if they both come head to head, that they are just going to have a fight because that's what they like to do. Um, <laughs> On, on the wings, boys, we've got Anthony Watson up against uh, Alex Cuthbert. Uh, no surprises here that Anthony Watson comes out on top. He's at 7.0 and Cuthbert at 5.6. And on the other wing, Jack Noel, he's at 7.2 and George North down at 6.6. So England winning the battle of the wings there. Guy, is that a worry for us? Uh, no, not really. To be honest, I think George North has come into a bit of form. He was helped against the Frenchman, but at the same time, he did look dangerous because we actually put the ball in his hands. I think Alex Cuthbert, the, the Englishmen that have voted in this thing are well within their rights to bang him down, and I think me and myself and yourself probably gave him low scores as well. But being perfectly fair to him, I watched him uh, play for the Blues. Um, he's played a lot since, he, since the World Cup, and he's getting better. And when I mean getting better, I mean seriously improving, getting back to a really dangerous runner. And uh, I think the way we're going to play against England won't necessarily suit him because we won't put the ball in his hands in space. But I'm still confident that when he gets the ball in space, if he does against England, he is going to do some serious damage. So I, I think it's a bit unfair that we're still lumping Alex Cuthbert in as playing the worst run of his career because he's definitely on the up. And we move into the centres. Uh, Jonathan Joseph, 6.6. .6. Jonathan Davis, 6.8. Milts is most hated player, and we'll move on to Guy's <laughs> most hated player, Owen Farrell, at 6.0, and Jamie Roberts with a 7.8 rating. Patty, where do you see that battle going? Um, to be fair, I think Jamie Roberts is probably your best player, and that includes Fallotel. Um, I think he's the perfect Warren Gatlin player as well. Yeah, he's he's definitely straight up and down, and, and look, he's everywhere. He was always. Hitting, he's always breaking the line, and um, you know he's, he's certainly a powerhouse in the middle of the field. There, that's probably why your wingers uh, haven't haven't scored very well because uh, the ball rarely gets out to them because it doesn't really need to in the way Wales play. Um, but I think I think Owen Farrell's not a not a centre for for starters, so you should be winning that battle regardless. Uh, now, Milt, I know you have to uh, you have to leave us shortly, but um, uh, are you all right to do the halfbacks, or do you want to give us a prediction yeah, and yeah, yeah. scoot off? No, I'm right. No, I've got a bit of time. I'm right. Good man, good man. Okay, we will come on to the halfbacks then. And this is where it looks really, really worrying for England, Milts. George Ford, 
is the lowest scored player in the 30. He's down at 4.8. Ben Young's 5.4. Dan Bigger then is at 7.4 and Gareth Davis at 7.2. How much of a worry is that for you, Milt? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that'll be a 9 and 10 for, for England. Um, I think the 2 and 80 factor... Uh, <laughs> Until they name a team, I'll, I'll be sceptical whether he might even start. Yeah. Um, and then if he starts, he's definitely not going to drop Farrell, so Farrell will play 10. Um, and I think the care and Young is actually a toss of a coin at the moment for him. I think he's done that in the way he's picked his helmet, which is why care starts. But I think, like, uh, I think it was Pat that said last week, he is dangerous off the bench. So he might stick with Young, so give him one last go. Um, but I just don't think I think George Ford is a bit of a media darling you know, he's a very good player but when he does things wrong no one seems to notice it he, he does make a lot of mistakes if, uh, I just think, don't think he's playing that great at rugby get back to Bath try and get them winning a few games and play like he was at the end of last year and then get himself back in the team but um, yeah I, I think Farrell will play 10 there you go I'll put my neck on the line I think you might be right, but I really, really hope they stick with Ben Youngs and George Ford at 9 and 10. But, I mean, if Eddie Jones is looking at what's coming the other way, then surely he doesn't want George Ford and Ben Youngs defending the same channel that Jamie Roberts, Jonathan Davis, Alex Guthrie and George North are going to be pelting down. Um, so yeah. I've got a feeling they, they might mix it up. Do you reckon they're going to start with two laggy mills, or do you reckon they'll, uh, they'll bring him off the bench? I'd like to see him start if I had to if I had to put the savings on it, I'd probably say they'd keep it as it is and too long he'd be on the bench and he'd be using an impact player. I think then you have care and too long he coming off the bench and that's some serious impact. Uh, but you know, like, that's a real good point you make. Like, Ford's not a bot though, in fact, but science says that you know, a guy twelve and a half stone is not gonna stop Jamie Roberts going full tilt uh, on the game line. You know, he will tackle him, but Roberts is gonna get over that game line every time and then that gives Wales momentum for the way they play. And Farrell is defensively strong and everyone knows that. Um, but we'll see. We'll, we'll just have to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's round up the backs then. So England finishing on 43.6 and Wales on 48.0. Again, there's the 4-2 split in terms of who comes out on top. So for England, Anthony Watson and Jack Noel come out on top on the wings, uh, ahead of Alex Cuthbert and George North. In the centres, Jonathan Davis and Jamie Roberts get the better of Jonathan Joseph and Owen Farrell. And in the half-backs, you've got George Ford and Ben Youngs eclipsed by Dan Bigger and Gareth Davis. And it's neck and neck between Mike Brown and Liam Williams at full-back. Now, looking at the whole picture, you've got England on 97.0 for the collective ratings total. And Wales are just ahead on 103 Point six. Now, I reckon the Twickenham factor probably counts for about 6.6, so that puts us tied up at 103 points. It, it, it is going to be that tight, though, boys, isn't it? Guy, I mean, it's, it's just going to be a score, it's going to be a mistake, it's going to be a bit of magic, isn't it? Uh, both teams are getting better as we go along, so it's a bit of an unknown, basically, who's, who's clicking quicker than the other, because we've got no fear for Twickenham guys we've shown this we went in the World Cup and beat them um, I think the boys have done it now so basically it's just another place to play I think the England team love it there so basically they, they raise their game I, I can't I can't call it based on the performances that's just gone being perfectly honest because there's, there's nothing in it there's, both teams are getting better getting better I'm calling it on this, the talent of both teams as we've just done with the drop by 22 scores I think we're better man for man so I'm going to back, uh, back the Welsh team to do a number on them. And I'm going to do a Corsi prediction and probably Wales by five points on Saturday. Wales by five. Melts, what do you reckon? I'm sitting on the fence a little bit. If England get off to a flyer and have a ten-point lead at half-time, I think England will win. If it is tight at half-time, Wales will win. I think Wales will see out a tight game. Uh I'm going to say England by four. England by four for Milts. I am going to say that, look, this Six Nations hasn't sparked as of yet. It hasn't really captured the imagination as previous ones has. 
until Saturday. <laughs> this is going to be one of the all-time classics, and there's going to be <laughs> I love it. one point <laughs> in it, and it is going to be a damn bigger penalty that seals it for Wales nah. by a point. Patty, what do you reckon? Um, I've been really disappointed in the Welsh team this Six Nations. I had high hopes for them uh, at the start. I've been quietly impressed with the way England have gone about their business, and I think they're going to continue to improve each game, uh, and I can see them winning by 10. Okay. <laughs> by 10 for Patty. Uh, <laughs> that, is a, that is a very, very bold prediction. <laughs> Good on some that. That's massive. If there's one thing I am, it's bold. <laughs> Um, the boys are going to watch it together the uh, Worcester Students Rugby All Boys Down at uh, Bournemouth we may or may not bring you some uh, some clips from there depending on how intoxicated we are but we'll definitely have a sit down with, uh, with Corsi and test his, his knowledge and coming back to Corsi's quiz any movement on the five that we've already got boys I can't do it it's still, it's still my head in I, I don't know enough of the, um, the baseball teams because there's fucking hundreds of them and um uh, no one really cares about NHL, really. Um, oh, incorrect, sir. I've got a pair of Boston Bruins slippers next door. Name three more teams. In the <laughs> NHL. <laughs> Rangers, Flyers. I'm just trying to make sure yeah, I don't yeah, name yeah, one yeah, of yours. On, Rangers, yeah. Flyers, yeah, that's fine. Penguins, yeah. you name them. All in with this. Exactly. exactly. Black off. Right. We will throw that one out to the listeners then. Don't Google it. See if you can come up with the answer. Um, and Gal, if you can get it, don't text me it. Put it on the Facebook group, okay? <laughs> Facebook group. I can hear him. He's downstairs cooking pancetta at the moment. <laughs> Beautiful. Right, boys, we're going to finish off with a brand new feature. It is called Extra Time. You've got 20 seconds to say whatever you want to say in, in the world, really. You've got 20 seconds. Here is your soapbox. Here is your platform. Uh, Guy, we're going to start off with you because I'm going to buzz you on 20 seconds because I've got a funny feeling you might go over the top. On three, you can let us know your topic and off you go. One, two, three, Guy. Uh, we spoke about it on Jota 22 before and it's uh, Leicester City winning the Premier League. I still can't believe it's happening, to be honest. It's more the case of everyone else bottling it but I'm just what, like to say in the 20 seconds that I have that I'm really behind them and I'm becoming a bit of a Leicester City fan and I really, really hope they do it. Um, go on, Leicester. Come on, you foxes. Bong. Absolutely nailed the timing. Patty, over to you. Go. Um, uh, I'm a bit on the spot here. Uh, I really want to rant about being timed and being restricted to a certain amount of time. Nice, yeah. If I want to have a proper rant, I'm going to use more than 20 seconds and, I'm, and enjoy ranting and, and building really some momentum as I speak because I don't think I should be limited to a certain amount of time. If I want to rant about something, I'm certainly going to rant about more than... Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Milts, go. Uh, I remember about 10 years ago having an argument with my dad. He said Tiger Woods was the best sportsman on the planet Earth. Now, I've had a quick thought while we're doing the program. My top three that are up for debate, but my number one is Usain Bolt, my number two is Novak Djokovic, and my number three is Lionel Messi. Oh, I'll put Messi. that one up for the viewers. And perfect timing. I'm going to go slightly off the sport. I'm going to go for the biscuit against cake debate, and especially... Jaffa cakes. Now I've got a. Uh, I, I made a prediction today, and I think I've solved the problem. Would you ever dip a cake into a cup of tea? You would not. Would you dip a Jaffa cake into a cup of tea? You would not because it crumbles. Therefore, it has to be a cake. Boom. <laughs> and there it is, gents. So strong, strong, strong point. England against Wales on Saturday. It's going to be absolutely enormous. Join us next week where we will dissect it all. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we can be looking back at a Wales win. England by Come on, you boys. Come on, boys. Patty, thanks Come for joining on, me in the studio. Boys, thanks for joining me on the phone. And thanks, you lot at home, for listening. This has been Dropout 22, a GD Media production.